Peter, thank you very much for that very kind uh, introduction, and thank you all for being here, uh, because I'm aware this is, is it the graveyard slot? It's the end of a very busy week for everybody, and I appreciate very much that people are here, and I hope there's some energy in the room for a few more PowerPoint slides and a chance to talk to you about, about deep Atlantic ecosystems. Um, my objective today really is to run through understanding a story uh, in three parts. I want to look at expanding anthropogenic activities uh, in the deep and open ocean, um, uh, the challenge of generating jobs and growth uh, to the, the planet, to an increasingly hungry planet, um, how we balance that, how we make that sustainable. We ask more from our oceans at a time of rapid global climate change. And I want, of course, as Peter's mentioned, to talk about the Atlas Project and the approach that we're taking in this basin scale uh, activity. So to start us off, it does sometimes feel like we're dealing with the three horsemen of the apocalypse. Things are bleak, things seem very bad, I wonder if our societies are quite as connected as they need to be to deal with the challenges that we're facing. The news isn't exactly great. I was watching CNN last night. I regret it now. <laughs> and here are some of the reasons that we're, we are so worried we've never seen before. Our activities in the oceans will expand uh, beyond all recognition. There's a, a small graphic there on the left-hand side showing deep ocean mining, something that when I was studying and when I was developing lectures for my first students, this was off the table. It would never happen. The metal prices were too low. The technologies would never develop. Well, now it is. This is starting to come alive. The ISA are consulting on regulations now right now are on deep sea mining. So we know there are multiple pressures from anthropogenic activities, and surrounding all of those pressures, of course, is global change. This audience knows everything about aspects of global change. I don't need to explain these curves, but the inexorable rise of CO2 on our planet has tremendous impacts upon ocean chemistry. You can see the rise in PCO2 concentration in the ocean and the parallel decline in pH. The acidification of the oceans is underway. 25% or so of CO2 emissions have been absorbed by the oceans. Most of global heating processes have been absorbed by the oceans. And we, we can add to that the tremendous concerns of the spread of deoxygenation in vast areas of the global ocean. There's a tremendous need for society to come together. And this isn't just an academic issue. It isn't just a government issue. Or it's an industry, government, academic policy nexus. It all has to come together. And we have to work very closely to make this happen. And organizations like ICES are, in, are at the spearhead. They're at the sharp end of this, of course. So let's start getting into some of the detail and some of the overview that leads me to where I want to go, which is into the deep ocean and the ocean basin scale of the, of the North Atlantic, actually. So there's a review here from Andrew Sweetman and, and colleagues where uh, it's a nice summary. It pulls together some of the big, big trends, the increase in abyssal temperatures by one degree centigrade. Now at abyssal depths, this is a substantial change, the decline in uh, oxygen in areas, key areas of deep water formation a very sharp decline in some areas of food supply to the deep ocean. Now, if you're only getting uh, in the deep ocean fractions of a sugar lump of food per meter squared per year, and that declines by half, you can see how that basic supply to those ecosystems is uh, projected to change very radically, very quickly. And as I've mentioned, the rapid decline in pH, particularly at bathyal depths, the acidification of the oceans. Which leads me to what, what Peter trailed, which is my, my own pet interest from the late 90s to now has been deep water corals, why they grow where they are, why they are important. They happen to be made from aragonite, these scleractinian deep water coral mounds, which is the most soluble polymorph of calcium carbonate. So if we have these structures as we do, here a picture from the Norwegian continental shelf, and we move into a future ocean, you can see here a, a, a graph going back to 2006, actually this was first published, and it shows the shoaling of the aragonite saturation horizon. It, there, are new, uh, there are better plots now in a sense, there's new modeled um, work showing the Arctic more, more clearly, but this plot was the first one that made that really important point that the areas that have been hospitable and suitable for aragonitic deep corals by the end of this century will not be. And nobody is really arguing that that's going to happen. It's a question now of understanding it and doing what we can to take the other pressures off to sustain uh, deep coral ecosystem function. 
This one um, certainly hit my uh, attention when it came out because things are happening that much faster, it would seem, than we had supposed. This paper shows that the um, of a turning circulation conveys a very fast acidification signal to some of these deep coral habitats. Um, there could be shoaling by up to 1,700 meters in the subpolar North Atlantic within the next 30 years. This is not a, not a long time. I don't know, I might still be working then. I'm not too sure if I, I want to be or not. Present day transport of carbonate ions uh, to the deep ocean, uh, about 44% lower than in pre industrial times, and a doubling of CO2 in the next three decades, reducing a transport of, export, uh, sorry, transport of ex excess carbonate over aragonite by up to 80%, 79% of the pre industrial. So things are happening faster than John Ginnott and his colleagues thought in the mid 2000s. When we start to look at that, and here is a quick diversion into some results where we try to experimentally understand the implications of that acidification signal on species like Lophelia pertusa, the deep sea, the deep sea coral. These are experiments that are difficult to carry out. It's hard to keep these things alive and to really put your hands on your hearts and say that in an experimental system you can produce a realistic manipulation of a complex field setting. But these are the, some of the best uh, insights that we have and things change quickly. The corals change their morphology, they grow longer, skinnier polyps in uh, higher CO2 conditions, but very tellingly they, um, they become, um, they, they start to dissolve. They start to slow their growth rates, they grow skinnier polyps, it's as though they're trying to grow up and out of the problem to feed perhaps more effectively. They also become about 30% weaker in these future ocean conditions. And this particular uh, graphic tries to pull that together. There you can see live coral uh, tissue protected by uh, protecting the skeleton. So this is why in many of the experimental studies, people will talk about deep corals dealing with things quite nicely. They still grow even at undersaturated conditions. We know this from the North Pacific where there's natural upwelling of corrosive seawaters and these species are found growing in small patches. But where you see the skeletons exposed uh, beyond that tissue, you'll find very quickly that the tissue, the skeleton, sorry, becomes pitted and eroded, and this is one of the reasons it becomes weaker so very quickly. Uh, we're following this work up at the moment with material science colleagues to really understand how those changes uh, take place. <laughs> So now let me move from that kind of scene setting about how things are changing and just how fast things are changing to consider this term blue growth. It's a term that's banded around a lot and what is our challenge? Well, it's to ba balance growth uh, and, uh, and economy, uh, economic developments and maintain a sustainable ocean into the future. So if we look at this particular infographic, what is this actually telling us? It's a European uh, Commission graphic and the sectors that uh, the Commission have um, pulled out are, uh, we, these are sectors that are regarded as having great growth potential. It's not all sectors of the blue economy, things like oil and gas and shipping, there's potential to grow, but not to the level that's anticipated from things like aquaculture, coastal tourism, marine biotechnology, ocean energy, and then the last one on that list is seabed mining, including deep ocean seabed mining. This is required because uh, so underpinning that has to be provision of new knowledge if we're going to make blue growth sustainable and to give credit to the European Commission, blue growth is mandated as a sustainable activity moving forward. We need to make it a sustainable activity or it won't fulfill the basic definitions of European blue growth. There's also an activity around the development of sea based strategies, including for the Atlantic Ocean. So this is some of the underpinning uh, policy that leads forward into projects like the Atlas Project that I'd like to talk about today. So to lead us into that, um, the Atlantic. It's an ocean basin where I've been privileged to work. Uh, it's the most fantastic setting, a highly diverse setting. The deep ocean um, is an extraordinary place. It's a young basin uh, from the mid-Atlantic ridge across to the margins. Through the Atlantic, the, uh, 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 the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, mediates 25% of global heat transport. There are intense air-sea interactions, tremendous drawdown of carbon into the North Atlantic. And the ecosystems of the deep Atlantic are highly connected as a result of this wide pattern of overturning circulation. There's been a significant investment that, that many of you will know about in terms of instrumenting the Atlantic. The rapid climate array, the OSNAP arrays, these are in place. 
I happen to have trained as an ecologist and biologist, and we don't need to go out and re-instrument the Atlantic, but we can interrogate those data sets, and we can work with those communities to understand the overturning circulation and how it may change, and how it may there, thereby impact upon deep Atlantic ecosystem function. So that leads us to some of those questions there at the bottom of the slide. How can we forecast how deep water function, biodiversity, connectivity may change uh, under different blue growth scenarios into the future? And those are the issues that are right at the foundation and underpinning of what we're doing in Atlas. And I always start my Atlas talks with an apology because Atlas is allegedly an acronym. And if anyone at the end of the talk can remember it, I will take you out and I will buy you a beer. That's the acronym on the slide. I won't bother to read it out. At a glance, this is what our project is trying to achieve. So it, in essence, it's a conventional piece of research. It's about providing new knowledge to inform a sustainable blue growth agenda in the Atlantic. The impact will be discoveries and outputs that will help people work together. Our stakeholders are part of our project. They're not a bolt-on at the end. We built the project with them. We continue the project together as, as we run. We started in 2016, so we're just over our halfway point at the moment. We, we finish in April of 2020. And amongst the core activities, we're a network of 25, now over 30, research cruises to allow us to access 12 case study sites spanning the North Atlantic. It's coordinated from the University of Edinburgh, and as it says there, we have 24 partners. Uh, the linked third party, a very EU term, is actually the Canadian government. One government, they're not so keen on signing other, other governments' contracts and grant agreements, hence that particular terminology. In terms of where we work and the focal ecosystems that we look at, this is a, a slide that summarizes the deep water sponge areas, the deep coral areas. Our focus is very much on structural seafloor habitats, seamounts, vulnerable marine ecosystems. These are the areas that we focus upon. And there is work in the mid-Atlantic, uh, also on some vent and uh, chemosynthetic systems as well within the Atlas project. I won't read out the roll call of partners, but this is a, a summary of the partnership. And it's a partnership that's built through the Galway Transatlantic Alliance, named for the declaration signed in 2013 in Galway to bring together uh, activities between Canada, the United States, and Europe. So Atlas is one of the projects moving forward under the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance. More uh, pictures in slightly sunnier conditions. We tend to meet in Spain because the weather is normally better. And I don't know if Stefan Passant happens to be in the room. He leads our data management work package. But Stefan, if you are, you are there, I apologize for the picture where you're not too impressed at the Atlantic weather that's sweeping into the Mediterranean where we, we meet each year. So the objectives overall, uh, it's to understand better deep Atlantic ecosystem function, provide that information, feed it directly through the stakeholder processes and into the science policy interface. That's in essence what the project exists to do. To do that, we need to improve the capacity to model and predict shifts in deep water ecosystems and populations, transform that into effective governance, and then scenario test using realistic blue growth scenarios. So this is an activity that tries, it tries its best to work from the natural sciences and the physical sciences through the biological into the socio-economic and then the policy inf information flow. So we try to cover all of those domains and Again, I do feel guilty for putting it up because these slides are incredibly dull, but this shows you the work packages, uh, European terminology for the pieces of work that are flowing through our project, so the physical oceanographic work that flows into a whole series of data gathering work packages. So we look at ecosystem function, we look at basic patterns in biodiversity and biogeography. Are the biogeographic provinces currently agreed in the Atlantic fit for purpose, or are they a bit simplistic? We look at what we call connected resources. So what is the connectivity of the populations that we look at, the key study areas that we look at? And then how do we value those ecosystem services? What's, what pressures are those ecosystem services likely to be under, under the future blue growth scenarios that we see happening? The case studies I'll talk to you about, but they span the Western, Central, and Eastern Atlantic. And then the work flows on to areas that have yet to really build up, but we see how that work flows into the context of a maritime spatial planning uh, activity, which we're developing. So let me now start to give you some hints 
and quick kind of summaries of what it is this project is actually doing and the kinds of results that we're starting to see. The project's founded upon the best understanding that we can gather in collaboration with uh, the physicists who set up those transatlantic arrays, looking at AMOX circulation. And it's really built on questions where uh, Peter mentioned the TRACES program, where we try to better understand the diaspora of deep sea coral uh, expansion in the Atlantic. So there's some very interesting patterns there. We see, for instance, expansion post-glacial of these deep corals by 7,000 kilometers in just in under 4,000 years, for, sorry, 400 years. Very, very rapid recolonization as a result of that overturning circulation spinning up rapidly. This far outpaces anything that would be possible in a terrestrial environment. So if we move forward into a, a, a time of altered AMOC, altered major ocean basin scale circulation, what are the implications going to be and how can we start to get a handle on those changes? So this led to our design and the Atlas project is working across the case studies that are illustrated on this map. They're rather small and I did bring a pointer for this purpose. They're rather small red stars. There's our first case study and you can see they span the Atlantic, they cross to the Azores, they move over to C Canada, the southeast United States, up and into the Davis Strait. They're deliberately selected to cross-cut major patterns in the circulation, to cross-cut jurisdictional regimes, and also to cross-cut uh, areas that were proposed as ecologically or biologically significant areas in the Northeast Atlantic, but, but not agreed, and areas that are agreed as EBSAs in the, the Western Atlantic here, areas closed for vulnerable marine ecosystems, areas down here are some of the few areas uh, licensed for exploration uh, for deep sea mining. And the overview of the slide, just to run your eyes down, uh, please don't try to read in detail, but you can see the areas in the Atlantic, you can see the focal ecosystems that we're looking at, um, and the lead uh, organizations. This particular area shows the kind of blue growth sectors that are either active or could be active in these areas moving forward. So you can see there's considerable range of activities that are getting underway in these parts of the oceans. Now, what should happen? This is clearly crazy, right? We're not moving into the scenario in this film of, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. But it is kind of a fun film to watch with your kids. But where are we going to, to head? I want to give you one example from an Atlas study uh, which looked at a key area in that overturning circulation by taking high resolution cores, very, very rapidly sedimenting cores from under the Gulf Stream off, off the Carolinas, and then reconstructing uh, the, the rate, the, 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 the near bed flows from that area. This is work published by David Thornalley earlier this year. And what this record shows by looking at the sortable silts is that in the, is it in the last uh, 150 years or so, we have been in a consistently and anomalously low state of AMOC. So all of the projections are showing us moving into an increasingly low AMOC state, increasingly sluggish overturning circulation. Now this study is suggesting we're already in a very low state. We have been for about 150 years. So we're still wrapping our heads around what this could mean as we move forward, and it isn't only David's work. A parallel paper uh, published at the same time based upon modeling studies has come up with a very, very similar conclusion. And this is getting debated backwards and forwards over time. What we've done in Atlas is take this kind of work. Oh, he, he did get a bit of a reaction, David. I should have paused there. Um, this is some of the coverage that came out following his, his paper. Some of it good. The BBC were quite balanced. Um, I, I, those that know the Independent in the UK, they were rather extremist in their, in their summary. So we've now been looking at this, and these are all colleagues uh, based at the Scottish Association for Marine Science who produced a really interesting deliverable. And if you're keen, <laughs> go to that website and you can download any of our outputs freely available so you, you can read this. Uh, they've gone through all of the indices of AMOC that could be generated and derived from the models that we're using in Atlas. They've summarized them in this report. There's more deliverables coming and more work coming to make this relevant to each of the case study areas and to understand how, what those uh, changes mean. That team have also put in place uh, uh, refinements and uh, elaborations of the moorings deployed by the OSNAP program, overturning subpolar North Atlantic program. We've added nutrient samplers and uh, um, oxygen sensors to several of the moorings in the OSNAP array. 
and the results are just starting to come back in. The first nutrient samples have come back in to, to Scotland just in the last few months. So watch out for that. And what I just wanted to summarize in a few slides is the kind of information that they've pulled together uh, in that particular report, looking actually at North Atlantic Oscillation, just to give you a flavor of the sort of work that's now emerging. So the NAO very much relates to the differential uh, pressure between the Icelandic low and the Azores high. In a positive phase, we'll see very strong winds uh, from west to east. Uh, in a negative phase, we'll see very much lower uh, uh, westerly winds. Now, over time, uh, this varies. This is a, a graphic that I've taken from um, the SAMS report. Low states in the mid-60s, 70, 1970, and in 2010, so examples there. High states in the, the late 90s and, and since 2015. Now, if we then start to look at this in terms of what the ecosystem relevance might be, well, here we can see these lows and highs plotted um, here in terms of anomalous temperature records at, at full ocean basin scale in terms of anomalous salinity records at the bottom, at the seabed. Uh, we've then started to use this in to, to inform our work and our interpretation of the distribution and likely connectivity of things like deep corals. We're not only looking at deep corals, but this is an example from a few years ago, published 2016, where we modeled the dispersal of deep coral larvae from the MPAs west of Scotland. And you can see here, if I, you can see the difference perhaps between the dispersal uh, in 1990 with a positive phase pushing in this direction with surface winds and a negative phase where the larvae are much more held offshore. So we see the, this is in theory what could be happening. This is a modeling study, but it does seem likely to be very strongly controlled by variability in NAO, creating these differences in the patterns that we see of the connectivity between now agreed MPAs. And we can start to feed that sort of information, which we now do in Atlas across all of the case studies with some of the model simulations I'll show you in a minute. We can start to see how these connected areas in positive NAO states become disconnected in negative NAO states. So if we move from one series of uh, what is normal to another uh, situation of what is normal, we might see very, very different patterns of connectivity in future ocean conditions. And clearly, this is absolutely fundamental if we're going to be moving ahead and designing properly ecologically coherent networks. So now let me just take you into some of the work that's emerging in terms of how we're simulating the potential dispersal of some of these key larval species. So this is work that's in progress. It's an ongoing piece of work. So I'm not showing you finalized results. I'm showing you the domain that we've modeled using the Viking 20 hydrographic model from Arnie Bierstock's group in Germany, Guillaume R. And we've used the Ariane particle tracking, um, uh, uh, Lagrangian particle tracking system. Uh, there is some biological reality in our thinking. I can't claim it's perfect because the data are very sparse, but there are key papers uh, and studies that are ongoing that have looked at um, the larval behavior of species like Lophelia, of Bathymodiolus, uh, and then there's a nice review um, that's come out on estimating dispersal distance in the deep sea and a good summation of the information. So that's informed some of our studies. Uh, and what we're doing is taking uh, we haven't made, this is not work that's targeted yet to a particular type of organism. We're taking a generic approach with generic behaviors. So we're looking at virtual uh, releases from our case study areas, and we've done it now for all of the case study areas. There'll be releases four times a year over a 50 year period that have been run so far. As I mentioned, they're tracked using Viking 20, so 1 20th of a degree hydrodynamic model, and there are about 10 million particles tracked for each behavior. This is a complicated graph from my colleague Alan Fox in Edinburgh. So what, if, you, if you read quickly down the lines, you can see the different parameters that Alan is changing in the model. So the time to reach maximum swimming speed is, is altered. The age at which they start to swim down is, is played with. The speed that they swim upwards is, is adjusted. And all of these things are run repeatedly to give different behaviors up to a close surface into the fast flows of the surface for a period of time, rapid descents or slower descents. And then we're using these to sort of set what we think could be the potential boundaries of dispersal capacity. This is our first phase. I want to show you some examples to give you a, an idea of how this is developing. And as I say, it's work that's in progress. This is not finished work. West of Shetland is a key case study area, a very important area for deep water sponge occurrences, a very important area for oil and gas exploration. Companies like BP have been operating there since the late 1990s. Uh, 
And here are some of the dispersals where we tweak the behavior. The greens show you the behaviors that I'm plotting above. So here there's a rapid rise to the surface, a period of time in the surface, almost 60 days, and then a descent to the seafloor. And you can see a very wide potential dispersal with that behavior, even you know, from west to north and east, an extremely wide dispersal from this site. Tweak the behaviors here. This is the green, very, very limited um, uh, time in the water column, very limited time in surface layers, and a very different dispersal in deep water currents associated with that. So we, uh, of course, it's intuitively obvious we need to understand the larval behavior. This is a key information gap. What we're doing is trying to test out the system to set the bounds um, uh, on what we might be seeing when we actually know something about the larval biology. I'll now try to play uh, this video, which I hope plays. Can you do that for me at the back? I think you might need to click the mouse. And then we'll run through uh, just a few seconds um, of this video, just to give you an idea. You can see the age and time. This was the dispersal uh, behavior we were looking at, behavior 12. And you can see by 35, 40 days, just how far virtual larvae released from the Western Shetland area can disperse. Yeah. I'll show you a few other stu case study areas just quickly to give you an indication of the variability that we see. The Azores shows a very, very different dispersal, a very restricted dispersal uh, capacity from taxa, from organisms like the Gorgonian corals and sponges that are found on the seamounts around the Azores. In contrast, uh, the Rechianis Ridge, uh, larvae released from a very wide area along the Rechianis Ridge, have a tremendous dispersal potential, both west and east. So what can we conclude from this? Some of the major take-homes here, behavior has an enormous effect on both the extent and pattern of dispersal, what those larvae do. Are they buoyant? Are they reaching the surface layers or not? There can be up to a 20-fold difference in dispersal. Some, the smallest behavior effects are seen in the shelf seas. Age of descent causes a great change uh, in terms of dispersal model, followed by the rate of ascent and then the rate of, uh, sorry, rate of descent and then the rate of ascent. The initial development of swimming and depth of dispersal uh, within the surface, uh, 150 meters, has less effect uh, overall. Some other uh, important conclusions from this we're seeing at the moment. This time in the surface um, is particularly important, and the distance below the surface also comes in uh, as an important factor. Something I'm not going to go into today, uh, we haven't really the time, but I'm happy to put people in contact with uh, the geneticists in Atlas. This work is led by Sofiano Hound at Ifromer, and she's working through the samples that, that have been gathered so far in terms of looking at the population genetics and the connectivity from this approach. Then we work to see how that marries up with our theoretical connectivity derived from the larval dispersal modeling. You see some major differences on this plot. Um, for instance, the, on the right, you see the Philia petusa is a species with a widespread and almost continual population distribution, a very well mixed species across the European margin, certainly. Whereas Madrepa oculata, another very abundant deep water coral, has a very much more constrained and, and uh, patchy distribution. It's less connected. There'll be fundamental differences, we would assume, in the larval biology that we don't understand at the moment. So the next steps in this work are to start pulling things together. Those of you who were at the Ocean Basin Scale session heard um, Jose's talk about habitat to distribution and species distribution modeling. So we now need to start pulling this information all together in one place and to grow the sample size, grow the understanding of the larval biology. This is a, a key gap. We can't get away from that, but also grow the number of samples that come into the genetic assessments. That's another fundamental gap. The, the challenges and the expense of sampling these areas has really limited that kind of work. So we need to integrate the modeled and the measured estimates of connectivity. Then we can start to ask these challenging questions about the connected nature of existing MPAs and whether or not key areas are missing. We'd also love to understand which areas might be the essential refugia. Are these the shallow areas, for instance, that are going to be way above uh, the uh, corrosive waters that shoal from, from the depths? Actually, areas on the shelf might be refugia in, in future years. We need to understand that. 
So a few examples now of other areas of the project I mentioned earlier, biogeography and our assessments of biogeography maybe being a little simplistic when we look at the existing classification schemes. And this graph just shows you how sparse the data are when we go into areas outside national jurisdiction. So the data sets that exist at the moment, downloaded from records like OBIS, show huge bias towards areas close to shore, of course. And when we get beyond that, we start to run into very, very few records, actually. Very, very limited information to draw the kinds of conclusions that we now need to make. I wanted to, to flag up a paper from David Johnson and colleagues, including Ellen Kensington from DFO, which was quite a, it's quite a stark paper, this one, uh, looking at all the area-based management tool areas um, in, in this uh, study across the North, North Atlantic deep sea. Only two of those areas are not impacted by future climate change impacts. Only two. One is the vent system right at the, the southern extent of that map. And the other is the, uh, the yellow region just here. Those are the only two that are not negatively impacted. Uh, so things are really set to change enormously quickly. And this is the context that Atlas is coming together. And for that to all work, it would be enormously remiss not to think about people and remiss not to use this graphic. Has people, I think everyone in this room has probably seen this slide, this picture. It comes from the New Yorker, actually, one of the best places to get cartoons on the planet. And it sort of says it all, really. I have this conversation with my mother all the time. <laughs> and we had this conversation in Atlas. Um, the first thing that our socioeconomic <coughs> colleagues did is they, they polled us to death and worked us to death, a so-called Delphi survey. So let's ask people who think they know something about the deep ocean. It's partial, but they know something. Let's ask what their opinions are about human activities on ecosystem services. Where were human activities likely to be positive or negative? What was the severity of the effect likely to be? What was the likelihood of an effect likely to be? So there's everyone sitting at an Atlas meeting, um, hiding from the rain, actually, and filling in the surveys. So this, this work has been done. I want to just show you some of the results that came from a risk assessment for, for different ecosystem services. So what would temperature change do? What would ocean acidification do? Um, positive changes are in green, negative are in red. Really, the take home from this is that things like temperature, people are thinking to have mostly quite severe negative effects on a range of ecosystem services, as would ocean acidification. When you move down to things like tourism in the deep ocean, unlikely to have tremendously bad effect. Biotech, probably a very limited effect. So we're starting now to work that system through um, as we move on through the project. And as we do these things in that room, in all of the Atlas meetings, we have collaborators from industry. We have a particularly strong representation from the oil and gas sector. It's not the only sector we work with. But in terms of blue economy industrial actors who have actually a real impact upon GDP, you really don't get much bigger than oil and gas. And in terms of operators that are working in the ecosystems that we're working in, in the deep sea, the oil and gas are uh, sector are currently the major, the major player. So we've worked with a number of companies and we do different things in different places with different operators. Uh, they've got particular uh, areas of interest with the project. So for instance, Statoil, now Equinor in northern Norway have a cabled seafloor observatory by the Lofoten Islands. The data from that C4 observatory are interrogated through Atlas at the Netherlands Institute for, for Sea Research at NEOS. Data from BP west of Shetland flows into our assessments of the sponge grounds, the area I showed you in terms of larval dispersal modeling. Work with Total uh, through Ifromer. Work with Woodside, which is an Australian energy company, is around environmental impact assessment. Should they move forward to drill in and around coral carbonate mounds? Now, I'll take a quick sidetrack here, just to be totally clear. If we, as we move forward, there is no doubt we need to burn less oil and gas. Be the very first person to say that. We're not there yet. We all probably flew, many of us, to this meeting. The lights are on, things are happening. We have to get off to a new energy system very, very soon. It's interesting, Equinor, Statoil are entirely rebranded without the word oil, even in their, their um, company name. In the meantime, we need to do better around how we manage these activities. This is more than clear from Deepwater Horizon. It's more than clear from activities around the world. So we try and be very practical in our approach in Atlas. We try to be very pragmatic. 
For instance, we're working with a number of operators in the context of the North Sea uh, to sample. We can actually gather deep corals from oil platforms. They've grown there over the last 40 years. Uh, look at that picture at the bottom. That, that shows corals growing on an oil platform. Um, there's a scale bar, three meters, and under that scale bar, can you see a ladder that fell off the platform at some stage? These coral colonies are vast that have grown on these platforms. So we are trying now to, when we are in fact plugging the genetic samples, which are one of the limiting factors in the population genetics work, we can get amazing sample sizes from these areas. We plug this into the analysis uh, that Atlas does in France. And this is quite big scale work. To get these companies to pause and go chip away a coral, and put it in alcohol and send it, does take some planning, it does take some partnership and some organization, but it can be done. This, of course, plays into the understanding of North Sea platform decommissioning uh, and issues of that sort. So I want to sort of move towards the end of the talk now by taking you into other domains, right? Still with a human factor, but very much around the policy and stakeholder work that this project does. As I've said right throughout, this has been before project and during projects an ongoing activity. It's not something we just leave to the workshop at some point. This is something that's done together throughout our activities. We meet uh, formally, though, several times throughout the program. We've met at the um, European Parliament, where we have formal science to policy engagements. We met the picture there outside a Canadian government building in Ottawa. We have uh, engagement with OSPAR and the NIAFC Collective Arrangement. Uh, I should say this work is uh, led by David Johnson, who leads the policy aspects of Atlas. The, it's clearly very important that we map on to AORA, I mentioned the Atlantic Ocean Research Alliance and uh, the UN Sustainable <coughs> Development Goal Agenda as this develops. And we consider uh, through all of this just how relevant what we do in Atlas is to the conservation of VMEs and EBSAs. Um, well, I was talking earlier about the World Congress on Marine Biodiversity, so we were particularly busy at that Congress where there was a, a very good opportunity to engage the global uh, marine biodiversity community. We had a session on uh, EBSAs at that meeting, for instance. And then consider using our case study design uh, how we need to make explicit the connections with blue growth by highlighting uh, key considerations. One of these is particularly the discussion that's going on right now uh, at the United Nations level for how we manage biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. So do we need a new legal instrument under UNCLOS to do that? How is that going to develop and evolve? Atlas has been at the preparatory committee meetings for that, presenting its research, engaging in that activity, and it was also represented at the first uh, Intergovernmental Congress uh, uh, that took place um, earlier this month. We're at the moment putting in a submission to the International Seabed Authority on the exploitation regulations consultation around deep sea mining, which is quite a document uh, to look at. This is, I've already trailed this, this was the, the BBNJ conference, so-called, and they're very simple, um, clear discussion points at that intergovernmental activity. Marine genetic resources, environmental impact assessments, area-based management tools, and the need for capacity building and marine technology transfer. So the first gathering has taken place, there will be two more, and the program is now moving very fast uh, on those discussions. We don't know how it will all play out, but projects like Atlas, interactions from our wider community through ICs and elsewhere are, are really fundamental to that discussion, uh, that BBNJ process as it moves forward. And I thought no better person to say a little bit about it than David Johnson, because I thought at 45 minutes in, you'd heard enough from me. So I'm hoping if I click this button, you'll hear David give a 30 second overview of activities at the UN. And that just hits the nail on the head. And that's what the project is all about. It's a, it's a basic science project. It's a fundamental science project with applied edges and socioeconomics that we have to feed straight through to these processes. And that's what David's team are very, very focused upon doing. So 
the way that we then round this out, and I just want to kind of bring things to a conclusion, is actually what we all do it for, <laughs> you know, why, why we want to do things like this, and it's to be in the environments that, that we love. It's to be in the places that we love to understand and work. And I wanted to reference this. There's the nutrient sample being prepared for the OSNAP moorings by, by SAMS. There's work from Ephraim Air going on. The vent uh, bottom center image there is a new vent field, the Lusso vent field discovered uh, during an Atlas and National Geographic cruise led by the University of the Azores, a pretty fundamental discovery. And there will be more such discoveries. I mean, we know the deep ocean is the least understood of all the areas on our planet. So here are just a few summary slides to wrap things up. The cruises that Atlas has been involved in. Ellen Kensington was chief scientist on this mission on the Coast Guard ship Hudson from Department of Fisheries and Ocean. The white line, top right, shows you all the, the transit from Halifax all the way down to Bermuda and back. Very interesting work on the hydrography of that area and also on the occurrence of fossil and relict uh, deep corals from some of those seamounts that we're working on at the moment. Uh, Covadonga Areja at the Spanish Institute of Oceanography led the Medwaves cruise. This is one of the most ambitious cruises from Atlas. Um, in 2016, uh, it was two years ago now, hard to believe for us, but it ran from uh, the uh, Gulf of Cadiz and out to the Azores and back again. Uh, an integrated multidisciplinary activity using uh, a deep water ROV. Uh, Dick Van Overlin has been a stalwart. He leads the work package on functional ecosystems. Uh, at NEOS, he's had a lot of ship time on the Pelagia, mostly working on the Rockall Bank, which has proved to be a really focal case study for us. Tremendous amount of information from Rockall Bank in comparison to some of the other areas. And then this summer, uh, just recently completed, um, I put at the bottom Galway Transatlantic Alliance in action because in this particular expedition, we had a sort of science drive and a plan pulled together through the European project through Horizon 2020, developed in collaboration with our colleagues at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, who arranged for new funding, 150,000 Canadian dollars, to be provided to keep the Amundsen at sea, which allowed us to deploy benthic lander systems on the bottom right, supplied from the United States of America, prepared and m mobilized for sea, that will record data in the Davis Strait for a year. So to me, this is where we have to do uh, more to work harder. It's at these intersections of the Galway and other alliances in the future because it's this internationalization of what we're doing that allows us to get into these areas and work more effectively. So when the world seems to be moving in a different direction, I think we have to go faster and harder in the opposite direction to do more of this. And we've got to really you know, work hard uh, on it. It isn't simple, but the benefits are tremendous when it comes together. I have to say that of all the cruises we've been involved in, this was the toughest to get set up and, and organized. Then there are other uh, collaborations and developments that start to lead us into the South Atlantic even. We've worked with this uh, program, the Marine ETEC program, uh, led between uh, the UK and Brazil. Uh, they've already looked at the Tropic Seamount. Uh, we'll, uh, we've interrogated and worked through all the environmental data from that Tropic Seamount cruise using the ISIS remotely operated vehicle. We found polyopogon sponge grounds on that seamount, which we, we never knew were there. Um, we're now following up with cruises that will be sailing next month with the Discovery using the Hibis sampler uh, to look at Rio Grande Rise. And we look forward in, into the future to more activities that integrate the North and South Atlantic much, much more strongly. Um, so far, I think we've generated approaching 50 peer-reviewed papers from the program. This, this is a summary of some of them, and there are another 45 that the project office has received from the consortium. So people are working really hard. Um, overall, these are our impacts that we, that we hope to achieve. This is where we hope to be. So we hope to do great science. We'll, we'll keep challenging ourselves to do that, but we are also challenged to, to do some very lofty and ambitious things, and it'd be great to be, to be on the line, to, on the road to some of these, to improve resource management through an ecosystem approach, to improve cooperation. I think this is something that actually we're enjoying very much and finding hugely beneficial. It's a natural and symbiotic relationship between the US, Canada, and, and the United States in these areas. We'll contribute to the uh, EU's integrated marine policy, strengthen the agreements that are out there to conserve VMEs and EBSAs. So as people pick away at these agreements and things start to change, we need to enhance the scientific evidence base. We need to keep coming back that we need to do this more, we need to do it better. And then engage with the UN processes, particularly on the new uh, international and legally binding instrument under UNCLOS, the BBNJ process that David Johnson talked about. 
And just to now bring things to an end, um, we also run an outreach campaign. Peter kindly mentioned Lophelia.org, which I had great fun with. In 2005, 6, 7, we developed a deep water coral outreach website, and it's a massively fun thing to do. In Atlas, we work with Dynamic Earth, an outreach center in Scotland. We'll refit an oceans gallery in, in Edinburgh. But we're also producing what we call digital assets. This is what David Murphy tells me they are. These are digital products that we can send anywhere. And you can download three-dimensional, 360-degree videos to your phone, put them in a headset, and then be on board the research ship, or be uh, on a 360 GoPro on an ROV. All these things we're working on at the moment, and we're working with school teachers across the European Union on getting that message out there. I wanted to do a very quick trail, if it's not too naughty to do so. If you're working at Ocean Basin Scale, you don't need to be part of Atlas. In fact, I'd really appreciate papers from outside of Atlas to this special issue on managing deep sea ecosystems at Ocean Basin Scale. Uh, we have around 20 papers in the works at the moment coming forward in that, and we're going to keep it running through till 2020. So there's plenty of time uh, if you're working in that area and you want to, to get involved in this particular frontiers in marine science theme on basin scale issues. So overall, the project is trying to do this. It's trying to pull together all of these aspects from policy and socioeconomics through to biodiversity, ocean circulation. Um, I like this graph because in the middle is networking, which is actually what makes it all happen. It's the interrelationships between the people and the organizations that make it happen. And I want to thank everyone who's actually doing this work and working so hard in so many places. The other thing that the project does, which is just marvelous, and all of us that have been involved in European projects have experienced this, you become part of a cohort that leads you through that project. And you think that the three and four years of the project are like a lifetime. At the end of it, you created a, a cohort. You created a bond between those people that then lasts. And it lasts for decades and decades. And that's what's going on here with our early career researchers and some of our later, grayer career researchers in the various places in the Atlantic and on the margins of the Atlantic where they work. Thank you very much.